second group of studies called Character Lessons from Bible Care. I was told years ago in speech uh, when I was learning how to, how to talk that oftentimes alliteration was good because it caught people's attention. Now, uh, being a character, just being a character is not what this is all about. Character is what you are, what people see in you, and what they perceive that you're like. That is who you are as an individual. And so today in this lesson, we're going to talk about the phrase, Behold, I thought. And when I came across this lesson, I thought, well, you know, I, I don't know how this is going to go. And then to begin piecing it together and looking at folks in the Bible and understanding how that oftentimes mankind thinks we're smarter than God. I don't know if you've ever thought about that. But today I think that's the biggest problem in, in religion. Today there's the greatest defection from what is called organized religion, which is normal church services and church buildings and that kind of thing. There's a greater defection from that because people have decided that they know better how to worship God than how God said to worship Him. And so today, much of Christianity and much of religion in the world has moved from where God has instructed in His Word to where they're comfortable with what they believe would be acceptable to God. In this book of 2 Kings, the fifth chapter and verse 11, the story is told about Naaman the leper. Naaman was a high official in, in Syria. He had contracted leprosy, and his little servant girl, who was a little Jewish girl, uh, probably a slave, uh, had instructed him, says, if you'll only go down to Elisha, the prophet down in, in, uh, in Judea, then he will heal you. And so he gets his group together, and they all get together and go down to, to see Elisha. And as this uh, great train of, of individuals arrives, he knocks on the door, and Elisha sends out his servant and explains to Naaman, he said, uh, if you want to be healed, you go out and you dip in the Jordan River seven times. That's it. Now, I, I don't know how you have felt about different things that have happened, and maybe perhaps uh, you've gone to a doctor, and the doctor has said, well, here's a simple solution. And you thought maybe, well, he might put you in the hospital for a little while. He might give you certain kinds of medicine, new medicines that are available and all. And the solution is very simple. And so our lesson thought comes from what Naaman's reaction to this is. He gets upset. I mean, he's an important guy. And the whole point of this is he thought something else was supposed to happen. And here's what the scripture says. Naaman was wroth. That's more than just miffed. He was really, really upset. And he said, Behold, I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover me from the leprosy. Are not Abana and the far, far rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? And so he turned away and went away in a rage. I don't know how upset that you get when things don't go your way. But <laughs> one of the things that they did on television just the night before last was they had a long article about what's called road rage. And they showed this guy that evidently had done something on a motorcycle and a car swerving over deliberately and knocking this guy off of a motorcycle. And they showed a second one in which evidently 
And they said that the, the reason that this guy got upset is because the person in, in one vehicle had washed their windshield and the spray from the windshield washer had gone over on his car and he shot in the car twice. And there were children in the car. Now, I hope you never lose that much control. I hope you don't carry a gun in your car to start with. But I hope you don't lose control to the point where that you would do something so foolish and so dangerous to somebody else. But here's Naaman. He's traveled all the way down from Syria. He stands in front of the house of Elisha. And he's expecting something great to come out. He expects him to come out and say a few mumble-jumble words. And then he would be healed. But he's told to go dip in the Jordan River seven times. Behold, I thought. You know, I have no difficulties in understanding that God wants us to think. But he expects us to think not more, or not to think that we know more than what he knows. After all, God knows everything. And as human beings, we are limited by time, we're limited by space, and we're limited by matter from knowing some things that transpire all at the same time. Now, I can't tell you what's going on on the street out here on Providence right now because I'm not out there. There is a wall between me and that, and I can't see. And so I am, uh, I am limited to what I can see. And I don't know what's going on in the library. They may be having donuts and coffee. I don't know. They probably wouldn't let us serve them here in the auditorium. There'd be somebody who'd say, well, that's unscriptural. Well, it may be unscriptural because they didn't have donuts and coffee back in the days of Jesus and when he taught in the, in, in the synagogues. But the whole point of it is this. Sometimes we think we're smarter than God. We have to remember, as a creature and not the Creator, we cannot think on the same level that God does. When I hear somebody talk about the old man upstairs, I want to back up because I'm just about ready to think that, that God's going to take a lightning bolt and strike them dead. He's not a man. He's not an old man on top of that. And we have to understand that God is so different from what we are that it's very difficult to explain who God is and what He is. Now here's what the Bible says about this. From Isaiah 55 and verse 8, God says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, and neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So, we understand that we cannot outthink God. And sometimes, men and women believe they do know more than God, and that their wisdom exceeds Him. And so our lesson this morning deals with a number of people in the Bible that had this particular problem. Behold, I thought the whole concept of them knowing better. And the first of these that we want to look at is Cain, and this comes from Genesis, the fourth chapter. You remember the story of Cain and Abel, of how that they had come to offer sacrifice, and, and Abel's sacrifice was accepted of God, and Cain's was not, and he became angry. Wrath, the Bible says. And he got so mad that he ended up killing his brother. What did God tell him about his offering? If you'd only done what I said to do, everything would have been all right. And so we know the story was that here was a man who thought that he could do what he wanted to do. He thought that the fruit of the ground was just as good as the firstlings of the flock, but he was wrong. He thought that one way was as good as another, but it was not. How many times have you heard that kind of expression about today's religion? People saying, well, it doesn't make any difference what you believe. One way is as good as another. 
Now, we're going to talk about that a little bit more in this particular lesson. This man never considered the fact that what he was doing was a sin, or maybe that this was such a little change that God wouldn't mind. This was a sin of presumption. Behold, I thought. Now, I hope that sinks in for a little bit because this is important as we go through this lesson today. The second one we're going to look at was from where our, our text is today about Naaman in 2 Kings, the fifth chapter. Naaman arrives at the home of Elisha, and he thought Elisha would make some kind of display. You would sort of expect in, in the days in which he lived, when there were prophets and there were uh, these magical people that could do all of these wonderful things, or thought that they could do wonderful things, he would come out, maybe wave his hand over, maybe even strike the place where the leprosy was to say, be gone and it's gone, but it doesn't happen that way. He actually thought that the rivers back home, the Abana and the Farpar River, were just as good as the Jordan River was. Now, have any of you ever seen the Jordan River? I should have put a picture up here of, of the Jordan River. I took a picture of it when we were over there in 1984. It's a beautiful river. We normally think of the muddy Jordan River. Well, it's just like the Tennessee River. You go at certain times of the year and it's beautiful and the water is clear and pretty. And you go at other times after there's been a hard rainstorm and it's muddy. And every river is like that. And sometimes we, we, we downgrade things just simply because we, <laughs> we've made a decision that we think it's better or, it, or something is worse, either one. But here in the area near Damascus, the Abana River it runs through the city of Damascus or next to the city of Damascus. And the Farpar River runs south of that in, in, the, in, in Assyria. This is the area that was called uh, Assyria, later today it's called Syria. Lebanon is north of this. Assyria goes all the way over to the seacoast uh, now. He thought, he thought that the simple, that the command was too simple. Isn't that kind of the problem we have in religion today? Well, it can't be that simple. It is that simple. You have to remember that at the time that Jesus was upon the face of the earth and, and the time that the New Testament was, was written, that there was very little education in the world. And so people had to be told in a simple sense in order for them to understand what was going on. The entire New Testament is in the, the entire Bible is written on about a fifth or sixth grade level. And this is to make it easy for everybody to understand, except for those people who think that they know more than God. Here was a man that simply said, Behold, I thought. Not what God's prophet said, not what did God say, but what I thought needed to be done. But it's also interesting to notice that he ended up, when he got mad, he started back home, and one of his servants said, Well, why don't you just do what he said to do? Try it. He goes to the Jordan River. He dips seven times. And what happens? He was healed. Here's a man that's happy over what's happened. Here's his soldiers that are happy over what has happened. Here's a man that is cleansed from his leprosy. And it was not a situation in which it was his decision. It was God's decision given to Elisha to tell him what to do. Now we're going to look at Jonah. Jonah is another one of those very interesting stories that's in the Bible. And there are a lot of things that sometimes we miss in these great stories. Oh, we understand the great fish or whale that swallowed Jonah. We understand the fish vomiting him out upon the land. We understand God telling him, to go preach to a, a heathen nation. Now, here's a man, though, 
that thought he knew more than God. And what do we find Jonah doing when God says, I want you to go to Nineveh, I want you to preach to that city so that they will repent, and Jonah runs away. This is out of a children's book about Nineveh. So Jonah ran from God and his plans, taking a vacation from his commands to a ship that was headed far, far away to the ends of the earth, for he would not obey. He gets on a ship that's headed for Tarshish. Tarshish, we believe, was in what is today called Spain. And this was as far in an opposite direction of which he was to go to go to Nineveh to preach to that great city that was there. He ran from the presence of the Lord. He thought he could escape responsibility. He thought he could hide from God. And so he gets on this boat as it sails to the city of Tarshish. And he goes to sleep. And a great storm comes along. And they're about to lose the boat. And the sailors take lots to figure out who it was that's caused all of this peril to them. And it falls upon Jonah. And they say, what is this that you've done? He says, it's my, my God that's caused upon this because I have not done what he wanted me to do. So they throw him overboard. Now, I don't know how that, that would stop a storm. But it evidently did. Because God's hand was in all of this. And the Bible says that God prepared a great fish. Some translation says a whale. Whatever you want to believe is, is fine, either one. If, if, if you were in the ocean and a great whale came up and was going to swallow you, you probably wouldn't debate, well, now are you a whale or a fish? You reckon? I don't think I would either. I just hope that it would be quick. And, uh, but it wasn't for Jonah. He survived in the belly of this great animal that God had prepared. And he comes to the conclusion, he says, I have done the wrong thing. I should have listened to God. And he is vomited out upon the dry land by this great fish. And I suspect he ran to Nineveh. He goes and he preaches. The city repents. And Jonah is upset over all of this. And he goes outside the city. He builds himself a little booth. And God sends a vine to come up and to cover him over to give him some shade. And Jonah sits there and pouts. And he waits for God to destroy the city. But it doesn't happen. And God sends a worm and destroys the vine. And Jonah gets even more upset. Because he doesn't understand what God is trying to do. The whole point behind this is that Jonah said, Behold, I thought, not what God thought, not what God said. And God was trying to get across to, to good old Jonah. He said, You know, there's a lot of people in this town, and they need salvation. They need to repent. They need to follow me. And so the question would be, today are we trying to escape God instead of serving him? The next person in this series that uh, we're looking at this morning is, is Peter in Matthew, the 17th chapter. The, the Bible says here, and this is when Jesus was upon the mount that's called the Mount of Transfiguration. And he glows in a bright light. And suddenly there appears to, the, to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. And if you wish, I'll make three tabernacles or three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And while he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them. And from the cloud, a voice said, This is my son, the beloved. With him I'm well pleased. Listen to him. People have asked the question many different times and usually to preachers, and said, well, how did Peter know that that was Moses and Elijah? And facetiously, I say, well, they were probably wearing one of these little plastic tags that says, hi, I'm Moses, or hi, I'm Elijah. No, I don't think so. This is one of those spiritual states 
in which we will know as we are known, as it said in the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians. Now what does that mean? It means that we will no longer be limited by time or space or matter like we talked about earlier. We'll know things that we have never known before. You'll know all about me, I'll know all about you. Why? Because we'll be exactly like God and exactly like Jesus, which is very different from what we are now. We will not be limited by time or space or matter because there will not be time, space, or matter as far as the next world is concerned. You and I will learn some very interesting things. In this, Peter thought three systems would be fine and honorable. And that's probably a pretty good stab by most individuals if he had been present and Jesus was there and all of a sudden Moses shows up and all of a sudden Elijah shows up. I'm sure that all of us would be a little bit on the terrified side and we would try to say, well, okay, let's do something really great because all these great people are here. Let's, let's build three tabernacles or three churches. And you know today there are three churches on top of this mountain? Behold, I thought, Peter thought to do something, and God said, no, wait a minute. This is my son. You listen to him. It's time for Moses and Elijah to move on and for people to listen to the Son of God. It's kind of interesting, too, because later on we find that, that, that he actually believes that Moses are in this situation, that Moses and Elijah and Jesus are all equal. Later on when Jesus announces that he's going to die, Peter says, uh-uh, you're not going to die. He says, and if so, I'll, I'll even die with you. You see, this is a situation in which Peter makes a decision that is not based upon what God says. Behold, I thought that we ought to build three tabernacles, one for Jesus and one for Moses and one for Elijah. He also thought, that he would not betray Jesus. And the night of the betrayal, right before they went out into the Garden of Gethsemane, was when he said, Lord, he says, I'll even die for you. And Jesus tells him, before the rooster crows three times, you will deny me. Not me, Lord. Behold, I thought I wouldn't do it, is what he's thinking. And the whole point in this is that it did happen, and the Bible says that he went out and he wept bitterly. Behold, I thought. How important it is for us to remember how much we need to know what the Bible says. I had a telephone call this past week from a lady in the, in the church that I had served, well, it's been more than 12 years ago, about 13 years ago now. And she and her husband have divorced. And she was trying to get me to say something that the Bible doesn't say. She says, well, I think I've read somewhere where the Bible says. Boy, that's like going out to go dove hunting with a blindfold on. Somebody says, there's birds, and you start shooting, hoping you're going to hit one. And I told her, I said, you need to go and read and see what the Bible does say. Well, where is that found? I said, what you are shooting at is found in the fifth chapter of the book of Matthew. Now go and read it, and you'll see what it says. I didn't want her to trust in what I said. I wanted her to trust in what God says in His Word. When I would teach people how to become a Christian, oftentimes we would come to a roadblock in which they believed something that they had been taught and had practiced for years that was not in the Scriptures or was in opposition to what the Scripture says. And what I would do was I would open my New Testament and I would turn it around upside down to me and I said, here, I want you to read this passage and see what the Bible says. And oftentimes that person would read that Bible and they would sit up and they would say, I've been taught wrong all of my life. Behold, 
I thought. Now we have to think, but we have to think what God wants us to think. Now let's look at, at Paul. Paul is another good example of one of these people who, who thought something that wasn't quite right. In Acts the 26th chapter in verse 9, Paul is relating his conversion. And this is what he says, Indeed, I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things against the name of Jesus of Nazareth. You want me to summarize this for you? Behold, I thought what I was doing was right. Why else would he be doing it? Unless he was just plumb me. He thought he ought to persecute the church. One of the outstanding things <coughs> in the seventh chapter of the book of Acts, we find the stoning of Stephen. And that's where we're first introduced to Saul of Tarsus. He is the one who stands and, and protects and, and make, secures the coats of those that stoned Stephen to death. He was giving his assent. He was giving them his permission he was agreeing with them that this is what needed to be done. Then a little bit later on, we find him with letters from the high priest going up to Damascus in order to arrest those people that call themselves the followers of Jesus. And he has an interesting thing happen to him when he's on the road to Damascus. Here's a man that's going along, thought he was doing right, thought he was doing what God's will was. He thought God would be pleased with him, and he actually thought that killing was okay as a religious act for God. Now, this was not a command of God, but it was a decision of man. Now, notice when Jesus appears to Saul on this road, he doesn't say, Saul, why are you persecuting the church? Saul, why are you persecuting my followers? But he says, Saul, why do you persecute me? Well, you probably are very familiar with the story of Saul. Here he is with the great bright light. He struck blind for three days. He goes into the city of Damascus. Ananias comes to him and tells him, said, you need to get up and you need to obey the Lord. You need to be baptized. And he does. And he begins preaching. Instead of defaming Jesus, he begins to proclaim Jesus. And the switch is so different is that the members of the body of Christ that he tried to join himself to didn't believe him. They've heard of him. They know his background. They know his reputation. They're not it. They don't want to talk to this guy. He's dangerous. He puts people to death. And Paul says, I've had a conversion. The problem was, I thought I was right. I thought I was doing what God wanted me to do. I thought that my relationship was right in the sight of God. But he was wrong. The last section that we want to look at is mankind in general. This gets all of us. We, we talked about certain individuals in the scriptures that had made the decision that they thought what they were doing was right. But they were in opposition to God. In the book of Proverbs, the 14th chapter and in verse 12... These words are recorded. There is a way that seems right to a person, but its end is the way to death. There is a way that seems right to a person, but the end of it is the way to death. It's the situation when we get a hold of and say, Behold, I thought. I said, This is what I believe. It's not... You see, the problem oftentimes is, is, is the difference between what I believe and what the Bible says may be as far apart as my right hand and my left hand. It may be as far apart as the east is from the west. And the whole point of this is, 
in this particular lesson is for us to begin to think about whether or not that my thinking and my action is in conjunction with what God says. Now it's kind of interesting that man thinks that all ways are scriptural. The Jews think they're right. The Muslims, the Muhammads think that they're right. The Buddhists think that they're right. And Christianity is the, is the last of these in which we put together and say, now, ask a person the question, well, which of these is right? Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Absolutely. But this is the view of the world today. Be tolerant of all these other religions because it doesn't make any difference what you believe. Why? Behold, I believe, I think, I thought that this had to be right. You know, we're living in a time in which it's very difficult for folks to say anything that will upset somebody else. Did you ever notice that? Now, when we're dealing with God's Word, and what somebody believes and practices is not what the Bible says, you're going to upset them. But it's not you that's upsetting them, it's God's Word that's upsetting them. And in the situation in which, behold, I thought, it's not what I think, it's what I'm doing because of what God has said. Man also, in many places, believed that sprinkling is the same as baptism. But if you were to translate the word baptizo as it is in the New Testament, it would never say baptism, but it would always say immersion. The plunging underneath the water. And sprinkling is not plunging under the water. And, and, and secondly, baptism is for those that believe in Jesus and a and a little child cannot believe. That's right. It's like putting a coat on. It's like putting a shirt on. It's something that you wear. It's your Christianity. It becomes your life. The man generally today thinks that everybody's going to go to heaven. I love this sign. I ran across this. I think this is either the second or third time that I've used this. Everybody believes that, uh, most, most people believe that in heaven. But there are a lot of people that don't believe in hell. And they believe everybody's going to go to heaven. Everybody's not going to go to heaven. I don't care what you think. The Bible teaches us that only those people who obey God and become Christians, become followers of Jesus Christ, are going to go to heaven. Well, what about all these other religions? We are here to instruct, to teach, to convert. That's our job as Christians. Our job as Christians is not to come sit in a nice air-conditioned building or heated in the wintertime and sit here and be spoon-fed from the pulpit or from the, from the teacher's viewpoint. Our job is when we are given this information is to take it out and to use it and to help people to find Christ and to find God. Most people in the world don't know about God. The Muslim will try to tell you, well, Allah and Jehovah are the same. How can they be the same if they teach two different things? God is not inconsistent. God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He's going to be the same a million years from now if the world goes on, and I don't think it will that long. Man also thinks that baptism is not essential to salvation. Have you thought about that? How many people that say, well, no, you're not baptized into Christ, you're baptized into the church, and that way you become a member of this congregation. No, you're baptized into Christ. That makes you a Christian no matter where you go. And then another problem that we have today of uh, mankind is that they believe that man will have a second chance to obey and get to heaven. The Bible doesn't teach that. It is good to think. 
thinkers use their heads. But it is wrong, it is not good to think wrongly. See this fellow, that's the kind of guy that you want to live next door to? It's like this. He says, get off my lawn, you juvenile delinquents. They're probably not juvenile delinquents. These kids trying to get home before the curfew's up. Or it's just a shortcut. But people are like this in life. Jesus said we would know the truth, and the truth would make us free. John 8, 32, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. What is the truth? That's the question that Pilate asked. What is truth? Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the truth. The scripture says, and Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes by, to the Father except by me, as Miss Rosa said. I mean, Miss Rosa believed the same thing, right? Amen. Okay. So we have to think, what we must think is what Jesus thinks and what God thinks. And the question is, do you think what God wants you to think? Or is your situation, behold, I thought. Our next lesson is going to be on Joseph, a lesson in forgiveness. Thank you. You've been very kind. I appreciate you you being so lenient and letting me be late this morning because of the traffic situation, but I couldn't control that. If I'd known it was there, I would have gone a different way and been here right on time. Thank you. We'll be dismissed for about 15 minutes.